Good morning. Our uh, reading this morning is continuing in Galatians, and we're reading chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord. Morning. It's great to see you this morning. I'm hoping my, yeah, there it goes, it's loaded up. For those of you that are visiting, don't have never met me before, my name is Paul, I'm one of the ministers here at Emmanuel, uh, and we are finishing off, or so close to finishing off, George is actually going to finish us ne- next week uh, on our journey through the book of Galatians. I, uh, there's a couple of things I need to, I want to share with you to start with, but the first is, I, I don't know, you, you may be sitting there listening to those three uh, lovely ladies talking about their, uh, I keep calling it Nitta Natter, it's not Nitta Natter, is it? That's a completely different group of people. Uh, but that, that, that chat and Natter group, and you think, well, that's really good, that's really exciting, there are people going out and, 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 uh, and having nice chats and conversations. Uh, but so what? You know, what does that actually mean for the kingdom? Uh, what they, they don't point out, and they don't talk about, uh, actually, I think the book of Galatians really helps us with, right at the end, and I'll go and tell you why. It says, you, you pick, may have read it out, from, um, picked up on verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, Paul writes, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. I'm going to leave it at that. If you know anything about Anita, the way she gathers the people around her, then you start to see those people start to come along to some of the church events that we put on. You know, whether it's the quiz nights or the, uh, some of the other events. She draws people together so that we can, uh, and then starts to invite them to church related activities, whether it's our Christingle services or whatever. This is exactly what we're talking about in a church. When we talk about a church that has a culture of invitation, you've got to have doors and opportunities for the invitation, which means you've got to get to know people. This is a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity to just go and do something really simple and then let's see what God does with it. You know, this is, this is just, it's casting nets. Not caster nets, casting nets. That's something different again. Casting nets and see what we catch. God calls fishermen. God calls fishermen. And, and the, 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 the stories of the fishermen in the Bible are all based on this when you rely, you fish in your own strength, you catch nothing. When you fish in God's strength, miracles happen. Okay. I'll just leave it at that. Now, uh, two, there's, 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 I've got two testimonies I want to share with you, but I do have a, a, a parish notice that I'm going to share now, not later. Uh, so it, it is with great sadness that uh, the leadership and the trustees have to inform the church that Jordan has handed in his notice with immediate effect. It is not anything that we have done as a church. It's for personal reasons that are going on in his life that he doesn't feel that he's able to continue in the role 
as our youth worker. Uh, so please pray for him, because uh, it's really important. We're not leaving on bad terms at all. I'm still maintaining contact with him and supporting him through some difficult times that he's going through. Uh, so uh, I wanted to tell you that. The leaders and trustees are aware, but I did want to, to tell you as a church that that's where we're at. So the, the two exciting testimonies, uh, before we go on to the book of Galatians. Uh, first, a, a couple of weeks ago, you may remember that I was sharing, I think God wants to deal with uh, some issues around hearing and tinnitus. And I suffer from bad, uh, I, my hearing has been poor and for, for years, and uh, I do get tinnitus as well. So I went up for prayer, and Grant prayed for me. He's not here today, but Victoria, you can share this with him. I still, I still have tinnitus. That has not gone away. However, f- uh, my career since leaving school has been in the police, and then since ordination, I've spent some time in the Air Force as a chaplain, and I'm currently in the Army as a chaplain. All of those organizations have tested my hearing regularly, and ever since I left school, I have failed hearing tests through bad hearing. I've got grade three uh, well, they call it a grade three pass, but you know, it goes one is the best, four is, you know, we have some serious issues with you working in this organization. Uh, and so it's been really, really poor. And I have in the past been given hearing aids. Uh, anyway, I went up for prayer. I got prayer. And then last, this week just gone, I had to go for a hearing test with the army. So I took myself off to Thorny Island Medical Center, had my hearing test. And I said, and he said, have you done this before? I said, loads of times. I'll tell you now, I will fail. I always fail on these. I got a grade one pass. Oh. So, uh, yeah, it's you know, God is good. And the second thing, God is good, even when we don't ask. And this is, an, this is a great little testimony as well. Our, our eldest son, Joshua, he has gone off to Ecuador. Uh, he is a, a zoology student, third year geology, zoology student at the University of Sussex. He's gone off on a field trip to Ecuador to study uh, monkeys in, in Ecuador, as you do. Uh, anyway, he is a, terrified about flying. He hates flying. He's really nervous, and he's never been through the whole airport systems before without mum and dad. You know, we've always been there to tell him, you need to do this, that, and and actually that's... And and it's not a direct flight either. He had to go via Miami, because there are no direct flights from the UK to Ecuador. So that process can be a bit scary. So he's... And and he's been through some difficult times. Uh, If you're a member of our church, you'll know his anxiety levels are quite high because of some mental health issues that he's gone through in the past. He was incredibly anxious about it. So we dropped him off at Heathrow, and he got through the customs very quickly uh, and was sitting on the other side, of, uh, on air side, waiting for his flight. Uh, he, now, he was flying. He booked his flight by himself. He didn't, they didn't do it collectively. He booked his flight by himself and reserved his little seat. He was flying on those Airbus 380s, which, if you're a plane geek like me, you'll realize it's the biggest of the passenger airlines that you can fly on. It's huge. One of those double-decker Airbuses. Massive, massive aircraft. Booked his little seat on the upper deck, which I'm so jealous about. (laughs) But that's another story in itself. He sits down on it. Sitting next to him is another student from Sussex University going to Ecuador via Miami on the same flight. So God is good even when we don't ask. God provides someone who's just going to journey with him. uh, And he's so much calmer. Going, sharing this journey with someone else. Uh, and, and so, actually, there's three of them on the same flight. Only one of them sitting next to him. But uh, nonetheless, three of them get to Quito in Ecuador and then can share taxis. So he's, you know, that is just a, a testimony to God's goodness. So we give him thanks, because he's amazing. <laughs> so... Uh, you bear with me where well, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere at the moment, and you might think, what on earth is he going to do? Why is he talking about this? Nothing to do with book Galatians. Uh, so, you, a brief recap of what goes on in the Bible. At the beginning, God creates everything, He creates it perfect, but He creates order out of chaos. Uh, and the sort of story of Genesis is that he, the first thing He does is He brings light into darkness. And that's pretty much what he continues to do throughout the story of the Bible. Every time there's darkness, he brings light. He introduces light into it. And at this time of year, we read John's prologue uh, in the the, the Gospel of John. And and John emphasizes this, that the light comes into the world and the darkness cannot 
overcome it. That's, been, that's a significant part of Jesus' ministry. If you look at the way Jesus ministers, it's countercultural to Jewish thinking. It's countercultural to Jewish thought. You see, Jewish thought was very much that darkness pollutes light. So, uh, for example, if you were a, a, a leper or if you had an illness, you were avoided at all costs because the, the, the thinking behind it is that if you have someone of good nature and, and good standing in society was to go near someone who was leprous or who was ill or, or who lived an immoral life, you would somehow be polluted by that. That sinfulness would rub off on you and therefore you would become polluted you would become sinful because that's how sin worked according to Jewish thinking. And Jesus came and said, no, the whole story of the Bible is complete opposite. That Actually, there is the power of God doesn't, isn't polluted but purifies. The darkness doesn't fight back, but is the light shines into the darkness and brings light into dark areas, which is why Jesus wasn't in any way scared of touching Blind people, touching leprous people, reaching out to the adulterous uh, uh, woman. If you remember that story. Yeah, he reached out and they're all scared of this because they, they're worried that somehow by association they would be associated with this woman and be tainted as sinful. And Jesus goes, rubbish. Absolute rubbish. That's not how this works. And actually what we, we see in Jesus' ministry, he reflects on the nature of holiness if you know anything about the, the encounters that Moses has with God, God, Moses is kept at a distance from God because God is trying to protect Moses. He said, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. And when God passes by Moses, he says, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock because to see my face is dangerous. You will die. The holiness of God is deadly for those that bear the weight of sin. But Jesus comes into the world and says, I clothe you with my righteousness. Therefore, you need not worry the face to, about the face of God any, because you, you are clothed in righteousness. Therefore, the holiness of God is no longer dangerous to you. The holiness of God is a place of peace. It's a place of presence. And he completely transforms. Paul unpacks this a little bit in what he says about the nature of what church is supposed to be like. He says, brothers and sisters, or in the Greek it's just brothers, but there's the concept, it, in both, it, 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 it encapsulates both genders. If someone is caught in sin, uh, and, and then he goes on to talk about what we have to do as a church. And so this, this, this term caught in sin is not something, it does, what he means, it's not those of us that come that have done something a little bit wrong that morning. We've had a bit of an argument with our, uh, our other half, our significant other, or we, we slightly crept over the speed limit on our way to church because we were running a bit late. That's not what he's talking about because we're all sinful people. We come here and God brings forgiveness to us. We get that. But there's this concept that caught in sin is something that's actually a little bit more uh, problematic. It's a little bit more uh, uh, consuming of the individual. It's something that they're trapped in. It's a repeating, persistent behavior that they need to be set free of. He said, if someone's like that in the church... We don't expel them from the church because we need to keep them away because somehow that's going to pollute the church. But the church has to positively, compassionately and kindly bring the light into the darkness. Shine the light into the darkness and, get and let the darkness go. So what he's talking about is what Paul has been talking about through all the book of Galatians so far is freedom. We need to set this person free. Don't worry that they're bound uh, in this perpetuating cycle of sin, of slavery, to this, this one sort of addiction, really, is what he's sort of talking about. So don't worry about that, but let's introduce freedom into the situation. So don't cast them away. Don't get rid of them. Say, well, I'm really sorry, but you know, this, we can't have this in our church. Let's work together to bring freedom. Now, let's not 
forget that in other passages in the Bible, Paul also talks about or what happens when they fail to deal with these issues. And there are times when actually repeating patterns of sin and they, where they, the, the individual does not want to give up the habit, is actually quite content living in this pattern of sin, then that's a different story. And that needs to be dealt with as well. And there's a process for that. But that's not what he's talking about here. He said, he, the image is very much of this person is trapped and they can't find a way out. But they desperately want to get out. They desperately want to get out of this pattern. But they're trapped in it. So Paul says, instead of allowing them to struggle on their own, gather around them as a church and walk with them out and help them out of it. But do it with compassion. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus' ministry was only ever driven through compassion, kindness, and love. And his, the healings that he brought, the freedoms that he brought into people were always really gentle. Did you notice that? I, got, I, I do get a bit, I struggle a little bit with some, particularly American pastors, who seem to think that somehow if you are sick or ill, you need to have it beaten out of you. Because that wasn't how I see Jesus' ministry. He had some weird ways of doing some healing. I mean, let's be honest. Spitting on the ground, making mud, that's an odd way of bringing healing. But it, you know, it worked. But he's only ever kind, compassionate, and gentle. Because as Martin spoke about last week, uh, On the previous passage, life in the Spirit is about demonstrating the the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit is not nine individual fruits that we try and pick up. It's not Woolworths pick and mix or the the Wednesday uh, market stalls in in Chichester. The fruit of the Spirit is all of these things collectively together. That's what the, the, the Spirit in your life makes you. All of those nine things, love, joy, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Off the top of my head. Um, that's only because I'm reliving that song that we, we you know, used to sing back in the 1980s in my head. So, so, so Paul talks about the restoration of people gently. But he, but he also says, look, sin, sin is sticky, Addictions are called addictions for a reason. Because they're addictive. (laughs) You know, if addictions weren't addictive, people would give them up really easily. But they're not. And it's such is the nature of sin. Sin is addictive, otherwise it wouldn't be problematic. Sin, if it wasn't tempting, would not be an issue. You know, if you really, if you didn't find something, if it didn't do something for you, either gave you the endorphin rush or whatever it was that you, that gratified your body in doing it, you would never have a problem giving it up. So it wouldn't, you know, the, the, then the, 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 the enemy would have to find a more intuitive way of introducing sin into your life. So Paul says, if that's, if that's the nature of sin, you need to be careful. So yes, you want to help these individuals, but what you don't want is to be dragged down with them. So I, uh, when I was, uh, one, of the, one of the things the Air Force trained me in was being a lifeguard, bizarrely. Uh, and when you're a, life, a poor lifeguard, you know, one of the things you have to be careful of is when you're going to rescue someone, that that person, in a trying to attempt to rescue them, doesn't drag you underwater with them. And if they're going to do that, you need to kick them away, calm them down, and then try and rescue them. Because what you don't want is to be dragged down with them and then having to find another lifeguard to rescue two people that are now drowning. That's the image Paul is saying here. So when you're going to to, to help people out of sin, just be wary that you don't get dragged into it as well. And if you find yourself getting dragged into it, take a step back, have a reality check, and maybe get other people around you to say, this is an area that I'm struggling with as well. And if that's the case, maybe the wisest thing to do is step completely back and say to other people, can you come in and sort this, help sort this, this situation out? Because I find that it's too close to the bone for me 
And it's an area that I could potentially struggle with as well. Let's be wise. You know? Wisdom is a gift from God. And there's a time when you, when you, hear, when you feel your spidey senses tingling, that it's the Spirit of God saying to you, this is too close to the bone for you. Do not do it. Get other people. And that's why this, this is written to the church, because actually we all own responsibility. And this isn't just written to the church leader. It's not the church leader's job to sort this out. It's the church's job. Collectively, we're all in this together, which is why uh, Emmanuel, we, we, you know, we're very much key to what we, what we do and what we think is about every, men, every member ministry. We all have a role to play. And that's not because James and I, as the ministers of the church, are just lazy. We just can't be bothered. So if you get to do it, it means less for us. Because that's not, you know, because that's biblical teaching. Is that we we are all in this together? It's a family, and, and, and Paul encourages us to carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens uh, to help people with with the loads that they bear. And Jesus says the same thing when in in, in the Gospels he says. Uh, my, you know, my burden is light. And he talks about this image of a yoke. You know, something that connects you to him, joins you together. And he says, and he's, this is the image that Jesus is saying, I will carry your burdens. And he says to the church, you must do likewise. Because that's the message to the church. Jesus is always saying it. You've seen it, me do it, now you do likewise. This is what I do, so so do you. Because you are my representatives, you are to represent me to the world. So there's this concept of of, of the collective nature of church, looking out for each other, looking after each other, being Caring, being concerning, but there's this nature as well of that he talks about here, and again illustrating the points that he has made about law and grace, about slavery and about freedom, or flesh and spirit. They're all different words that he talks about to you to mean the same thing. And he goes on to talk about that. In this passage, he says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. You can try it, but he won't tolerate it. Why? The sense of God being mocked is almost, you're mocking him by trying to deceive him. A man reaps what he sows. If you reap a certain behavior, you're, the, the consequences, we all know that. that it's the law of physics, isn't it? The sort of, uh, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's as though God knows what he's talking about when he writes thousands of years before Einstein and our great physicists. Or Newton. Well, or indeed Newton. Another great physicist. Did he? Oh, I did not know that. Usually it'd be Martin that corrects me around issues of physics. and. Uh, I'm sorry? I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, right, yes. I, no, I get the pun now. I was thinking, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so a man reads what he sows. Whoever sows with the, to please the flesh, well, that's what you'll get back. Well, you'll reap destruction. And so... If, if what you're doing is you, you're sowing things just to, 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 to please yourself, to the earthly desires, if that's what you're doing, that's a path to destruction. Why? Because it's the path of legalism. It's the path of oppression. It's the path uh, against the will of God. But if you're, doing, if, you're, if you're sowing things to please the Spirit, and that's why that, you know, this little simple chat and natter, I think is such a great idea. Why? Because we know there's high levels of loneliness. 
at the moment. And, and if anything, COVID has only concentrated that. Uh, and with loneliness has come to high levels of, of uh, mental health issues and all the associated behaviours. And then add into that a cost of living crisis where people are cold at home and if we can f find warm spaces for them to get out. Uh, and God, so God says, what are you doing in these situations? Because my spirit wants to reach out to these people, wants to reach out and to be, provide comfort and, and companionship and warmth. And then slowly over time, my spirit wants to reveal something of the nature of a loving God to them. If you, if, and, and sowing these little seeds... What do, they, what do they reap? Eternal life. And so let's not stop doing these things. Let's not get weary for doing good things. And there are times, isn't it, where you can get, uh, what do they call it, uh, charity fatigue? Is that, what they, that, is that what they call? Well, you know, you just get a bit fatigued for, from giving and giving and giving. And God says, don't stop, don't give up. Don't give up sowing good things because every time you sow a good thing, you're planting a seed for the kingdom. And God calls us to plant seeds. And the image of the sower is one that we plant seeds. The sower plants and the, plant, and the image of the sower is God casting the seeds. And, and it, we, what he, he, has, he has no control of is how the seed responds in the situation. It all depends on the, the ground that it falls in. But the more seeds you cast, the more harvest you get. So don't stop casting seeds. Don't stop doing good because that's how the, you reap harvest. That's how we grow. And as a church, we want to grow, isn't it? Not because we want to be a mega church. Heaven forbid that should be our vision statement. It's not. You know, I do not want to be leading the biggest church in the Diocese of Chichester. Not because that because that's not what we're about. We want to grow because we want to see people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. That's what we're about. And if we end up with the biggest church in the Diocese of Chichester as a result of that, well, fantastic. If we don't, who cares? Genuinely, who cares? As long as people get to know the love and saving power of Jesus. And these people are set free from the things that oppress them, which Paul was talking about. And the whole of this story of, of Galatians are set free from all the things that, people, uh, that bind people, their addictive characters, their addictive behaviors, the, 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 the slavery to sin the, uh, and the law. And they're set free to live in the grace of God and the power of, and love of God and to know him, to serve him and to live in his kingdom. That's the important thing. And so keep looking for opportunities, Paul says. Keep looking for those opportunities. And we continue to do that at Emmanuel. We're always looking. Carol is working so hard, along with other members of our leadership team, to find opportunities to say, how can we make a difference? That's what we're about. That's what we're about. The, I'm going to finish on this because I know Monica's got a lot more to do yet. The interesting report, Speak Jesus, and, and there were, I don't know if there's still out some books at the back about this. If there are, if you're interested, go and grab them. It's the, rec the most recent, uh, recent survey done by the Hope organization, Speak Jesus, has looked at, looked at, uh, our society's attitude to the church and to Christian, Christians, and they're as different. They're, they're different. We know because the, this week the governments have released the census, haven't we? That actually, church, that that people who associate themselves with Christianity has dropped the first time below fifty percent. Is the church worried about that? Not particularly, because we think we've known that for a long time. But what the people are starting to wake up with is actually. Just because you were born in this country does not make you a Christian. You know, just because you were born in McDonald's does not a hamburger make you. Um, and so people are becoming a bit more astute to that fact. 
But we, don't, we, are, but we are well aware that church attendance is declining. We do know that. But Speak Jesus tells some really interesting facts. Relationships are key. Relationships are absolutely key to mission in this country. Because they look at an organization and all of the negative things are seen against that organization. You look at it, if they look at the church, it's high levels of, of hypocrisy, high levels, this is perception, high levels of hypocrisy, high levels of homophobia, uh, of misogyny, all of these things that we do not want to be associated with. You ask me exactly the same questions Remember, this is the survey done about thousands and thousands of people in the UK about a Christian, a, an active Christian that those people may know. So they, they, you know, they know a Christian who goes to church, who regularly worships God, and you ask exactly the same questions. And those negative values are significantly lower to the point where they're virtually insignificant. And all the positive things that we'd want to say about what it is to be a follower of Jesus are really high. They are kind, they're caring, they're loving, they're generous, they're warm, they're hospitable. All those things that we think, we know this. So what does that tell us? Let's not stop doing good. Let's build relationships. Let's find opportunities and ways to do good. Because why? Because that's how they get to see Christianity and Christians at work. Because they look at an organization and the church no longer has the voice to speak into the situation. But a Christian friend does. Because they value you more than they value this 